Welcome to my 14-day SAT prep course. My name is Hayden Rohde, and I scored 1590 on the SAT. I've scored perfectly on the SAT math section on back-to-back -back SATs. I've also scored perfectly on the SAT writing section on back-to-back -back SATs, highest score being a 1590 in total, and I also scored 1580 before I scored 1590. So in this 14-day SAT prep course, what you're going to need is you're going to need a notebook, a workbook, a calculator, and a pencil. Now I'm going to move pretty quickly through what you're going to need and things like that today because I want to get straight into teaching you guys what you're going to need to know for the SAT. So what to expect out of this 14-day SAT prep course is you're going to get to know some math formulas. That'll start today. I'm going to try and get you uh, comfortable with all the math formulas that you should need on the SAT. And then after that today, I'm going to get into some grammar rules that you need to know. Tomorrow will be focused, um, part, at least half of tomorrow will be focused on reading strategies. Um, and then also throughout the 14-day SAT prep course, I'll be giving you my tips and tricks for each section of the SAT and really giving you an inside look at what me, a 1590 SAT score, is looking for on the SAT that allows me to be very efficient in finding the correct answer really, really fast and getting rid of wrong answer choices just as fast. So basically just trying to get you really comfortable with the SAT and hopefully improve your score before you take your next SAT. So with that today, we're going to be focused on teaching you math formulas and then also grammar rules. Tomorrow we'll focus on reading and math and with that let's go ahead and get started with today's lesson all right so for today's first lesson we're going to go through math equations and the formulas you need to know for the SAT there's right around 35 or so that you should really know for the SAT so I'll go ahead and teach you all of those today it'll probably take right around 35 or 40 minutes I'll be having to move a little bit quicker through this if you're looking for a slowed down version uh, you're going to want to look at my 90 day SAT prep course I have out but if you're trying to get this done in 14 days then you're just going to have to go a little bit quicker like I'm going to so with that let's go ahead and get started so the first few equations that we're going to be doing I'm going to categorize under algebra so this will be algebra one and two basically the equations from that that you're going to need to know for the SAT so with that let's go ahead and get started with the first one that's going to be your slope intercept form of a line Okay, so slope intercept form of a line. So I'll just write slope intercept form. Okay, this is going to be your y equals mx plus b. And y equals mx plus b, your b is going to be your y intercept. So I'll write y int for y intercept. Your m is going to be your slope. Okay, so if your slope is positive, it's going to look like that. If your slope is negative, it'll go down. All right, and then you know that your y intercept, if you have a positive y intercept, so a positive b value here, that would be somewhere there if you had. Um, y equals mx, and then let's say you had minus 5, then obviously your y-intercept would be below that x-axis. All right, and the next equation that you're going to need to know, or the next formula, is going to be vertex form. Okay, vertex form um, deals with parabolas. Okay, a parabola would be something like this. We could write one as, uh, we could say 9x squared plus, we'll go 2x plus 1, right? So you've got an x squared term, you have an x term, and then you have some constant. So in vertex form, your vertex form would look something like this, or it is this. So your vertex form is going to be y equals, we'll say a, and then we'll go uh, x minus, we'll do j for our variable there, squared plus h, where your center then, or I'm sorry, your vertex, vertex is going to be j and h. So one thing that I really want to point out and stress here is that we see that we have that minus sign there. So if you have that x minus and then some number, it's that number that is your x-coordinate of your vertex, okay? It's not the negative, okay? The negative is always there, or that subtraction sign is always there. So if you have x minus 3, then 3 is your coordinate for your x-coordinate of your vertex. And then obviously you have plus h, h being that y-coordinate of your vertex. All right, so that's the vertex form of a parabola. The next equation that I want to show you is going to be the distance formula. So for the distance formula, there's a couple ways that I think that you should look at it. So we got distance formula is going to be our next one. So there's a few things that you should know on this one. Basically, the simplified version is that your distance is going to equal the square root of your rise squared plus your run squared. Right. So now if you don't know what rise and run mean, another way that you can look at this is being the square root, I'll have to move to the right here, of your second x-coordinate minus your first x-coordinate squared plus your second y-coordinate uh, minus your first y-coordinate squared. Okay, so obviously that stems from a squared plus b squared, which I'll cover later on, um, but this is your basic distance formula. So it's your rise squared plus your run squared. So if you're using a graph, you can use rise and run pretty easily. If you have points, then you're going to want to use that x, uh, your second x term minus your first x term squared plus your second y term minus your first y term squared and then all underneath that square root. So that's your distance formula. All right, so the next equations that I want to cover, the next one I'm going to do is the quadratic formula. And then with that, I also want to put in 
Um, a quick little side note with this as well that I think you should have in your notebook. All right, so for your quadratic formula, quadratic formula deals with your roots, your roots or your zeros of your graph. So if I've got a graph like this, let's say that my um, parabola looked like that, right? It's finding these zeros there, okay? So that's going to be your zeros or your x's are going to equal negative b plus or minus the square root b squared minus 4ac all over 2 times a. Now, what are those a's? What are the c's? And what are the b's? Well, let's go ahead and give you an equation so you can see. Let's use that 9x squared. Um, I think it was like plus 2x and then plus 1 is what we'll go with. Let's say that this is our parabola. Okay, so this is our parabola. We'll say it's y equals that, right? Y equals that. That's our parabola. So in this case, your a value is going to be your coefficient in front of x squared. So a, in this case, would be 9. So a would equal 9. Now your b value is going to be right here. That's whatever is in front of your x variable. So that is going to be, in this case, b would equal 2. And your c value is your constant, and that's going to equal 1 in this case. So your c value is whatever your constant is, your b value is whatever is in front of x, and your a value is whatever is in front of x squared. Now if there's nothing in front of x or x squared, then it means it's 1. All right, so that's your quadratic formula. Now, let me just take out my notes real quick because there is something I want to put in here as well that you that you should know for the SAT. Um, it's something that is probably for the people who are shooting for right around 1,400 to 1,600, but I think it's something that's good for everyone to know, so I want to include it here. So this deals with real solutions, right, uh, versus imaginary solutions and the number of solutions. So this is going to be dealing with b squared minus 4ac. So that's your quadratic formula. Now, this is going to be a side note under that, okay? So I'll just put it underneath all of this. Um, this is not part of your quadratic formula necessarily. Obviously, it's your term underneath the square root, but I want to show you something that deals with uh, parabolas right here. So keep in mind, this is with the parabola, just like the one I showed you above. So it's your b squared minus 4ac term. Now, if that b squared minus 4ac of your parabola is greater than zero, then that means you're going to have two real solutions, right? And I'll show you what that means in a minute here. Then that means that you're going to have two real solutions. So two real solutions. Now, if b squared minus 4ac is equal to 0, let's say it's equal to 0, that means you're going to have one real solution. And keep in mind, b, a, and c are all the same as they were in that above quadratic formula. All right, and then let's say that b squared minus 4ac, let's say that that is going to be less than 0. If it is less than 0, then that means that there are no real solutions. There are only imaginary solutions. Okay, then that means there are no real solutions. So what, are the, what does this mean? Let's draw a quick graph. So I'll put a graph over here. Let's say that we have a parabola going like this, right? Well, that means it's got two real solutions. It has one, and I'll put this in a different color so you can see it. I'll put it in blue, right? We have one solution there, and we have one solution there, or one root there, and one root there, okay? So it's really telling us how many zeros we have. So that would be two real solutions. Let's say that b squared minus 4 uh, AC equals zero. Well, in that case, we would only touch that zero point once, right? So we would have one real solution right there. And let's say that it uh, never equaled zero, and then it would look something like this, right? We'd have a graph, and it never touches that x-axis, right? And that's going up. Okay, so that covers that side note I wanted to put in. You should put that in your notes as well. All right, next up, we've got dealing with exponents. So I want to touch on exponents. So we can, this is obviously still under algebra, but it's also important that we know that this is going to be exponents. So this is really going to be three main things that we want to know here. So let's go ahead and cover um, the division of exponents with the same base. So to start, let's say that we have x to the second power over x to, or I'm going to say x to the 22nd power. And let's say that we're dividing it by x to the 14th power. Okay, now keep in mind that this rule that I'm going to show you only works if you have the same base. So in this case, our base is x, which means that x to the 22nd divided by x to the 14th, that's going to equal x to the 22nd minus 14, right? So that's in parentheses up there. Okay, so that's going to give us x to the 8th power. Now, when you're dividing uh, and you have the same base, you're just going to subtract your exponents. Well, what if you're multiplying with the same base? Let's say we had x, um, let's do to the 3rd power times x to the fourth power. Now, you might be thinking you should multiply them, but you should not. You need to add them. You have the same base and you're multiplying them. That means you're going to add your exponents together. So that's going to equal x to the power of 3 plus 4, which is going to equal x to the power of 7. Next up, I want to show you what we're going to do if we have, um, let's say that we have x and we'll raise it to the 
uh, we'll go with the third power and then we'll raise that to the fourth power. Now this is where you're going to multiply. So you're going to have that three and you're going to multiply it by that four because you're raising x to the third to the fourth power. So now you multiply and you're going to get x to the power of three times four, which then will give you x to the twelfth power. Okay, so that's really what you need to know as far as exponents. Now one other thing that you should know is if you have something to the negative power, let's say that we had um, x to the negative, let's say we had x to the negative one half power. Okay, what's that going to equal? You do need to know this as well, so I want to quick show you this. That's going to equal one over the square root of x. Okay, and here's why. That negative, if you see you have a negative exponent, then that's going to mean that you have one over whatever it would normally be, right? If you took away the negative, you just put that on the bottom. So let's say that I had x to the negative 2. Well, that's going to equal 1 over x squared. So I hope you see how that works. If you have a negative exponent, it means you have a 1 and then over whatever it would be if the exponent was positive. All right, moving on. All right, I guess one other thing I should show is with fractions and exponents. Let's say that we have x to the 1 third. That's going to equal the third root of x. Okay, so it's not the square root of x, it's the third root of x. That's just one other thing you should know. So your denominator of your exponent goes on your outside of the box. If we had x to the two-thirds, x to the power of two-thirds, and that would be the third root of x squared. Okay, moving on from exponents. So that covers our exponents. Next thing I want to cover is going to be uh, the sum of perfect squares. So I want to cover the sum of perfect squares, and then I will cover the, di the difference of perfect squares. So let's say that we have put sum of perfect squares sum of perfect squares. All right, so like I said, keep putting this in your notes. Let's say that we have x squared, or I'm sorry, let's say that we have x uh, plus, we'll use j, x plus j squared. Okay, this is going to be our sum of perfect squares rule. That means that that's going to equal x squared plus 2x times j, and then plus j squared, right? And keep in mind, x and j could be any letter um, variable. So the big thing that you want to do is you want to memorize this, right? So the reason that this is useful, obviously you could just multiply x plus j times x plus j and get the right answer. But if you can memorize this rule, it'll save you a lot of time on the SAT math section and time saving is very important with the SAT. That's why I stress memorizing this. Now the other thing that I want to show you is when you have a negative version of this. Let's say that we had x minus j squared. Okay, that x squared stays the same, and that plus j squared is going to stay the same. Now, but what's going to change is the fact that you're going to have a minus sign now. So you're going to have minus 2x times j. Okay, so you got to keep that in mind. The only thing that changes if you have that minus sign is that you're going to switch from this plus up here down to that minus down there. Next thing that I want to show you is going to be called the difference of perfect squares. So we'll call difference of perfect squares. All right, so the, dis the difference of perfect squares. So this one right here is another one where you just want to memorize it because it's going to save you time. Let's say that we have x minus, we'll use j again, times x plus j. Okay, so this is called the difference of perfect squares. You're going to end up with x squared um, minus j squared. x squared minus j squared. Okay, so the reason that this happens is obviously if you were to FOIL it out, you're still going to get your x squared, but you're going to have minus j times x, so minus jx, and then you're going to have plus j times x, so those will cancel out, and then you have minus j times j, giving you minus j squared. So if you can memorize the difference of perfect squares, that will also save you time on the SAT, which is very important. All right, so let me look at my notes, see if there's anything else I want to add in here before I move on. I feel like I'm good and ready to move on, so let's go ahead and keep going. If I'm moving a bit quick and you want to go take a look at my 90-day SAT prep course because you want to slow down a little bit, you can feel free to do that. You can find that in the playlist of my channel. But we're just going to keep on moving as much as we can. The next thing that I want to show you is an extension of the difference of perfect squares, um, and it deals with imaginary numbers, right? So really, it's just the difference of perfect squares, but with an imaginary number in it. So I'll go ahead and pick a variable. We'll call it h for 1, and we'll call, we'll just use j again, or let's use, we'll use, uh, we'll use z for the next one. So we have h plus z i. Okay, i is an imaginary number. When you see a lowercase i, it's going to be an imaginary number. So you got h plus z i times, we'll do h minus z i. Okay, so like I said, this is an extension of the difference of perfect squares. Um, some people call it the complex conjugate. So it's going to equal h squared. And then if you're following that difference of perfect squares, then you should know that it's going to be minus 
z times, or I'm sorry, minus uh, z times z squared times i squared. Now the thing that you need to know here is that i squared, i squared is equal to negative 1. So since i squared is negative 1, and you know when you do this, you're going to get a negative z squared i squared. i squared is negative 1. You know you're going to end up with plus z squared, plus z squared. Okay, so you're going to end up with h squared plus z squared in that scenario. So what you want to know is if you can memorize that equation, then you see this part right here that I'm boxing up on the SAT math section. You don't have to do all that work. You can immediately recognize h squared plus z squared. All right, so that's kind of an extension of the difference of perfect squares. So that's why I put it there. That's called the complex conjugate. So you can put that in your notes as well. Um, you should also know i squared equals negative 1. That's important. I'll cover more on imaginary numbers later. Um, but for now, just know i squared equals negative 1. All right, next thing that I want to show you is going to be dealing with uh, growth and decay. And then after that, I'll get into some stuff with um, finance and statistics that you need to know for the SAT math section. All right, so talking about growth rates and decay rates. So basically, there's uh, pretty much one equation that you should know for this before we get into other stuff that's more typically dealt with in, in uh, finance and things like that. So that's exponential growth and decay. Okay, so it's one equation for both of them. You just got to be able to apply it to either scenario. Let's say that we have y equals some initial amount, which we'll call a. And then that's going to be multiplied by 1, plus or minus. It's going to be your rate, right? So that's going to be a rate of uh, increase or a rate of decay. It could be either one. And then it's going to be raised to the power of t for time, right? So let's say that our rate was, uh, let's say we're increasing by 5%, right? We're going up by 5% then in that case, r would be 0 0.05. Okay, so you'd have 1 plus 0 0.05, 1 plus 0 0.05. And let's say that we were uh, having it grow for, let's say, two years. Um, and let's say we started with $500, right? Or 500 grams or whatever. It doesn't really matter, right? Then that would be your equation there. Now, let's say that you were going down by 5% now. Let's say that you were losing 5% each year. Well, in that case, you would do 1 minus. 0.05. So keep in mind if you're dealing in percents that you want to pay attention. If you have 5%, you don't minus 5, you minus 0.05. If we were going down by 50%, let's say we're going down 50%, then it would be minus 0.5. Okay. So that's what you need to understand for exponential growth and decay in that model. All right. So we're doing pretty good on time here. Now let's go ahead and move on to um, some models that are more financial and dealing with uh, statistics more. Uh, the SAT math section does deal with some things with money and statistics, so it is important to know these equations because they do show up fairly often. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about is going to be dealing with uh, the average. So let's actually jump down to statistics and we'll come back to the financial models. So we're going to deal with the average and the mean real quick. So average, this one's pretty simple. It's going to be the sum of all your terms, sum of all your terms all over your number of terms, okay? So that's your average. The average and the mean are the same thing. Um, so if you see average, you see mean, just understand they're interchangeable, they mean the same thing. It's the sum of all your terms all over the, the number of your terms. That's how you get your average. Next thing that you should know is you should also know the median, okay? So the median, let's say that we have a group of numbers. Um, I'll go ahead and put them right here. Let's say that we've got three, let's say we got seven, um, nine, 10, and 15. Okay, if you're going to find the median, what you're going to do is you're going to get rid of your smallest value, then get rid of your largest value, then get rid of your next smallest value, then get rid of your next largest value, and then that's going to leave you with your median. So your median in this case is 9. Now let's say that you have an even number of uh, numbers. Let's say that we had 3, 7, 9, um, let's say we had 11, 12, and 15. Right, so in this case, we have six numbers. We have an even set of numbers. You're going to get rid of your large, smallest, get rid of your largest, get rid of your next largest, next smallest. Now you're stuck with two. Now when you're stuck with two on the SAT, what you're going to do is you're going to take the average of those two. So in this case, your median would be 10. Okay, so median in this case would equal 10. All right, the next thing that we need to cover is going to be the mode. Okay, I want to cover the mode as well. So the next thing that is going to be covered is the mode. So the mode is just which number shows up most often. Okay, so which number shows up most often in a set of data? Shows up most often in a set of data. So I'll give an example of that right here. Let's say that we had the numbers 3, 7, 7, 7, 8, 8, 
um, 2 and 1. Okay, in this case, our mode would be 7 because it shows up three times, and the other highest number is um, 8, which only has two of them. So the number that shows up the most is 7, thus 7 would be the mode there. So in that case, our mode would equal 7. All right, at this point, at this point, I want to come back. Um, actually, I want to stick with this for one more minute. Let's go ahead and do standard deviation real quick. Okay, so standard deviation, you don't need to know the formula for it. Um, if you took AP statistics, then you already know the formula for it, but that doesn't matter for the SAT. They don't expect you to know the formula. Uh, don't bother memorizing the formula for standard deviation. You just have to be able to identify it. So the best way that I think can think of explaining standard deviation and the way that it usually shows up on the SAT is generally um, in charts and graphs and things like that. So I'll just make a quick one right here. Let's say that we've got number of, let's just say eggs. And then number of eggs, right? So we've got two, two little uh, charts or graphs of the number of eggs. Let's say that we've got seven right here. Um, let's say we've got nine. Let's say that we've got 11, right? So these are the number of eggs. And then our, we're going to plot the, we'll say, frequency of each one. Okay, so we're going to have our average just be at nine, right? We've got, there's a lot of them at nine. Okay, and then there's some that are at 10. Some of that are at eight, right? But we see that they are mostly concentrated right around nine. There's, we'll say there's only one at, at seven, one at 11, and there's nothing beyond that, right? 12 has nothing and six has nothing. Now let's take a look at the number of eggs over here. Let's say that nine, once again, is our average. So we'll put a few here, okay? But then we're gonna have 10 also have three. We'll have eight also have three. And then let's say that we've got two over here has two, um, three has two, we'll say four has one, and then we'll say on this side we've got 15 has two. We see that there's a lot more deviation from our average on this one right here. So we would say that the standard deviation of, we'll call this graph two, graph two versus graph one, we would say standard deviation of two is greater than one. So standard deviation of two or our second graph is greater than the standard deviation of our first graph. So standard deviation is just measuring how much deviation or how much distance or spread there is pretty much from your mean or your average. So in graph one, we are very concentrated and I'll put it in blue to show the concentration. We see we are very, very concentrated around our average. Whereas in graph two, we are really, really spread out. So there's a lot more standard deviation in the second one. All right, after this, I'm gonna come back now and now we're gonna go back into those financial models I was talking about. Okay, so we got financial models again. Okay, financial models. Okay, so these are going to be the models and equations you need to know about finance for the SAT. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. First thing, simple interest. Okay, so these are going to be uh, two types of interest equations you need to know. So interest equations, there are two of them. First, simple interest, it's a lot simpler than the uh, compounding interest. So we've got simple interest. All right, so simple interest, your amount that you um, owe, for example, let's say that A is the amount owed, that's going to equal your initial value, which we'll just call capital I for initial value, uh, times your interest rate, or I guess I'm going to switch I so that you don't confuse it with interest rate. We'll call it, and we'll call it C uh, for capital, okay, your capital. So that's going to be your initial amount that you took out in a loan times your interest rate times time. Okay, so I'll go ahead and put that. This is your initial amount of loan, initial amount of loan. Okay, R is going to be your interest rate. So I'll put IR for interest rate. T is going to be your time. And A is going to be the amount owed. Okay, so an example here, let's say that we took out a loan of $1,000. And let's say our interest rate was 5%, okay? So our interest rate's 5%. Now, keep in mind here, if you're talking about the amount owed versus the amount accrued in interest, okay? So if you're talking about the total amount owed and your interest rate's 5%, then you have to use 1.05 times however many years it was. But if you're doing how much money you have to pay only in interest and not based on how much money you took out, then you would be doing $1,000 times 0 0.05 times T. Since you're not including that amount that you took out, you're only talking about the interest um, that has been added on to that initial loan. So that's one thing to watch out for with simple interest. That's really the only thing that makes it complex, however. So now let's go ahead and talk about compound interest. 
All right, so compound interest is a bit more complicated. So in this case, the amount that you owe A, and keep in mind that we also have to apply this rule of understanding um, when to use the amount accrued in interest versus the amount um, that is total in total you owe. So the same thing that I was talking about, and I'll put it in green so you see where I'm pointing. Same thing I was talking about with that one here versus that zero here, we gotta understand that here as well. All right, so let's say that we have our A amount owed in this case, for compound interest, that's going to equal our initial amount, which we'll just call C for our initial amount of the loan. Multiply it by 1 plus our interest rate R divided by N. N is going to be the number of times that it's compounded in one term T, right? So once again, we have T representing time, R representing our interest rate, C representing our initial amount of the loan. Now, N in this case is representing the number of times that the interest is compounded per unit T. So I'll write N equals number of times compounded per t compounded per unit of time which is t so this one right here i'm definitely going to need to give you an example so you can kind of see how it works so a is going to be our total amount here okay so we're going to say this is the total amount owed our total amount owed now keep in mind interest can also work as it uh if you're if you're a biz or if you're a customer and you have a money in the bank you can also earn interest on that so it's not necessarily always that you owe money sometimes it can be that you gain money as well but that's just another side note so we've got let's say that we start with once again one thousand dollars let's say that we are uh, returning five percent so one plus zero point oh five because we're returning five percent let's say that we are compounding it quarterly which means four times a year um oh, hold up i made a mistake here this has got to be a to the power of nt a to the power of nt, n times t. Okay, so we're compounding it four times a year. Then we're going to raise this to the power of four times. Let's say that we only did it for one year. Then it would just be to the power of four. If we were going to compound it uh, for a total duration of two years, then it would be four times two. Okay, and then four times two. Okay, so if it was two years, we're compounding it quarterly. That's what your equation would look like. Obviously, that four times two would equal eight as your exponent there. Okay, so like I said, put this back in your notes. Obviously, I, I missed putting that N right there. Make sure that you add that. I'll put it in green so you see where I'm talking about. Make sure you put this N in there. I forgot it initially. Put it back in. You'll probably see something pop on your screen at like the 24-minute mark or something um, when I missed that, showing you that it was there. But as now let's go ahead and move on. All right, so that covers our kinds of interest. Um, that pretty much covers our financial models as well. At this point, I want to get into some, some more with statistics. All right, so we went from talking about some stuff with statistics then we went back to the financial models now i want to go back to statistics in this case we're not going to be dealing with equations really we're going to be talking about statistics as a concept more all right so concepts of statistics you need to know for the sat all right so there are a couple big things um, one thing that i want to add here that not a lot of people necessarily talk about is the deal with a uh, biased sampling okay so i just want to touch on that real quick so biased sampling okay if you're looking to conduct a survey of a whole population and you only survey people who let's say own dogs and the survey is about whether or not to put a dog park in the town that's going to be a biased sample because people who own dogs are more likely to want to put a dog park in a town okay and that's an example from the S one of the SAT practice tests um, that I was working with today that's something you want to watch out for is biased sampling okay another thing that you want to understand is if you are doing a sample Right, so now this is obviously separate from bias sampling. If you're conducting a sample, you're gonna want it to be random, right? Now, if you have a sample and you're given a scenario where they say that they gave a drug to only people who had diabetes to test if it cured diabetes, obviously you can't have a random sample of people who don't have diabetes. Um, but if you're just doing it on a general population, you're going to want a random sample. Okay, so another thing that we should talk about is random sampling, right? How should it be done generally? You don't necessarily need to know exactly how a random sample should be done, but just say something about uh, using a random number generator or using a random number generator of calling certain numbers, right? The numbers obviously have to be random that you're calling, but something like that. So random sampling is important. You want to use a random sample in order to determine if there is a correlation between things and such like that. Um, next thing is a random assignment, right? So let's talk about if you are conducting a study, like I talked about with with diabetes. Let's say that there's a new diabetes drug that claims to cure diabetes. Uh, random assignment. Okay, so you're, you're talking about this drug and they say that they want to test it to see if it cures diabetes. Um, they also want to 
want to cause side effects. So what you're going to want to do then is you're going to want to give half of the patients the actual drug, and you're going to want to do it randomly. You're not going to want to pick it by a single trait because then it's not random assignment. You want to give half your patients the drug and half of them a placebo. Right, so the half that get the drug, you want to do it randomly. So it wouldn't want to be the first half of the alphabet. It wouldn't want to be just the second half of the alphabet because that's not random. You'd want to use a random number generator or something like that. So that's random assignments. That makes sure that you can have results that are statistically significant. All right, so at that point, I think that we've covered most of the stuff with statistics. So now the next category that I want to really want to get into and need to get into um, is going to be dealing with geometry. And on the SAT, there is a little bit of trigonometry, but it's really not too difficult, so I wouldn't worry too much about it. Obviously, you need to know it, but don't let it stress you out because it's generally the more simpler part of uh, trigonometry. So now we got geometry and trig, right? So we're no longer in algebra, no longer in stats or anything like that. Now we are in geometry and trig. All right. I do actually, I'll, t I'll just tack this on at the end. So let's just go ahead and get started with this. All right, so geometry and trig. I'm going to have to go back at the end and show you one thing in algebra that I forgot to put in. All right, so let's go ahead and start with, um, we're going to start with trig. So we've got trigonometry. All right, so I want to talk about cosines, sines, and tangents real quick. Um, I hope that you guys know SOHCAHTOA. If you don't, I'm going to explain it to you right now. Okay, so the sine of an angle. The sine of an angle is equal to the opposite leg over the hypotenuse. Okay, now let's talk about what legs are which. So let's draw a right triangle, right, because Sokotoa deals with right triangles, and we're going to do angle X right here. Okay, so this is the angle I'm going to refer to as angle X. Now, angle X, we'll call our side lengths, we'll do a side length J, we'll do a side length um, Q, and we'll do a side length of Z. All right, so the sine of angle X, so we'll actually take out theta and we'll put in X. Sine of angle X is going to equal its opposite over its hypotenuse. So let's take a look at our opposite, and I'm going to put the sign in blue, right? So I'll put the sign in blue and I'll use different colors for these so you can see them. All right, so opposite of angle X, we see that that's going to be Q, okay? And we know our hypotenuse is going to be J. Obviously, our hypotenuse is our long side, so then we're going to have J, right? So the sine of X is going to equal Q over J. Next up, let's talk about the cosine. So cosine we'll put in green. We've got the cosine of X, okay? Now cosine is going to be our adjacent over our hypotenuse adjacent over our hypotenuse. So our adjacent leg then to angle X is going to be Z. So we'll have Z over our hypotenuse, which we already determined was J. All right, next up, let me switch my color real quick. Let's do red. All right, so next up we're going to have is the tangent, the tangent of angle X. Okay, we know our tangent of angle X is going to equal our opposite over our hypotenuse, or I'm sorry, over our adjacent opposite over our adjacent. Okay, if we look at angle X, our opposite we see is going to be Q once again. So we're going to have Q over our adjacent, which we see is going to be Z. Okay, so that's what you need to know for sines, cosines, and tangents. So not too bad there. Yeah, so other than that, um, one thing that we do need to talk about as well would be degrees and radians. Um, also, let's just go ahead and take a minute to talk about a squared plus b squared real quick. We haven't talked about that one yet. It's generally pretty common knowledge, but we do want to make sure that we include it. So a squared plus b squared, or a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It's dealing with triangles, right? Let's go ahead and draw a triangle, show you how it can be used. Let's say that we've got a hypotenuse of, we'll do 10, and we'll say we have a leg of 8. Right, so in order to determine which what the length of, we'll say it's x, what that unknown leg length is, what we're going to do is we're going to take our hypotenuse, which your hypotenuse is always c, so it'd be 10 squared, and we'll just one of our legs um, obviously is going to be 8, so you have 8 squared, um, and then you have your x squared over here. At that point, you know 64 is 8 squared is equal to. You subtract 64 from each side. My writing pad's not really working well. All right. For each side, that's going to give you 36. So you're going to have x squared equals the square root of each side. Yeah, my writing pad's not working right now. Um, let me unplug it real quick. All right, so you're going to have x squared equals 36. You're going to have to take the square root of each side, and you're going to see that x equals 6. All right, so x would equal 6. 
So that's how you use a squared plus b squared equals c squared. It's called the Pythagorean theorem. If you want to put that in your notes, you're going to need to know that one for the SAT as well. And while I'm on triangles, I'm just going to keep going with triangles for a minute. A few things that you should know with triangles. So triangles, there are a couple of them that are useful to know just as with uh, the Pythagorean theorem and understanding which ones go together. So I'm just going to put common triangles you should know. So triangles you should know. All right, so the first one that you should know is going to be the 3, 4, 5 triangle. 4, 5 triangle refers to a triangle that has 5 as its hypotenuse. Hypotenuse of 5, and it's got legs that are 3. So that's the first triangle you should know. So the other triangle that you should know is called the 5, 12, 13 triangle. So the 5, 12, 13 triangle is another one that shows up fairly common on the SAT. Obviously, once again, your longest side is going to be that 13. And then you're going to have 12, and then you're going to have 5. And obviously, that's not to scale. It would look more something like this with a 12 there, 5 there, 13 up top on that hypotenuse. All right, so that's the other triangle you should know. Now, one last thing about triangles that could be helpful to save you some time. It's not necessarily something that you have to have memorized to get it correct because you could get the right answer by doing it um, algebraically, right, by using um, the formula for the area of a triangle. But this is a shortcut if you can memorize it. This is the area of an equilateral triangle. So an equilateral triangle is a triangle in which all sides are the same length. You know it's equilateral triangle because it looks something like that. It'll also have angles that are all 60 degrees. So all of its angles will be 60 degrees. So that's another way you can know it's an equilateral triangle. So the area of an equilateral triangle, you need to memorize this one. If you can, it would be really helpful if you do, is the square root of 3 times a side length squared. Keep in mind all the sides are the same length, so pick any side and square it, and then divide it by 4. Now keep in mind that this is an equilateral triangle only. So 4 an equilateral triangle only. Now, I totally misspelled equilateral there, I'm pretty sure, um, but that doesn't matter. So just understand that that's for an equilateral triangle only. Yeah. So if you memorize that one, you can save it some time. You should put that in your notes if you can. All right, at this point, we can go ahead and move on to some circles. We've covered pretty much everything with triangles I wanted to cover. Now we can go ahead and talk about some circles. So the first thing I want to talk about with circles is obviously going to be the equation for a circle. So now we are on to circles. All right, so let's talk the equation of a circle. So we're going to have x. And it's going to be plus y minus k squared. And then that's going to equal our radius squared. So r is our radius. We're going to have our radius squared. So in this case for our circle, our center is going to be, let me go ahead and rewrite that real quick. Our center is going to be, let's see if I can get it to, there we go. Okay, our center is going to be at h. So what you want to notice here is that h, it comes after a minus sign. And k comes after a minus sign. So if you were to have something like plus 3, and we'll square that, and let's say that we had plus y plus 2, it equals r squared, right? R comes back. It doesn't really matter for the point I'm trying to make. So then you got to understand that your would be at point negative 3 and negative 2, right? Because it's x minus h and y minus k. So you got to understand, if you have plus, then you're going to have to have that minus 3 as your center and your minus 2 as your y-coordinate for your center, or your k-coordinate for your center. So that's just one thing that you should note there. All right, so that covers your equation for your circle. R, obviously, is going to be your radius. You've got to remember to square that. If you don't remember to square that, you're going to get the question wrong. All right, next up, that's your equation for your circle. Let's cover some other stuff with circles and with um, degrees and radians and things like that. So let's go ahead and talk about radians and degrees real quick. So that's applicable to circles as well as to triangles, but mostly, most common, I've seen it with circles. So let's go ahead and talk about this. Let's say that we have 360 degrees. Okay, 360 degrees is equal to 2 pi radians. Okay, and this is important to know for the SAT. So how do we convert between the two? Well, let's say that we have, have degrees. All right, so we have degrees. Let's say that we've got, let's say we have 90 degrees. Okay, we have to solve for what that is in radians. What we're going to do is we're going to multiply to get rid of degrees. 
And this is a strategy you can use on the SAT, and I'll talk about it at some point later as far as canceling units. Um, but for now, you just got to understand that there are pi radians in every 180 degrees. So we see, obviously, we have 90 and 180. We know 180 is equal to double 90. So we could rewrite this then as 1 times pi over 2, right, which we know will just give us pi over 2 radians. So then we know pi over 2 radians is what 90 degrees is in radians. Now let's say that we have radians. If we have radians and we want to get to degrees, what we're going to have to do then is multiply by the reciprocal of pi over 180. So what the reciprocal would mean is let's say that we've got, we'll say we've got pi over 4 radians. But pi over 4 radians, we want to get to degrees. Then we're going to have to cancel our radians. So we're going to put that pi on bottom. We have pi radians with 180 degrees on top. Now we see our pi's are going to cancel. Right? Pi's cancel, and we're going to be left with 180 degrees all over 4, which we know then will equal 45 degrees. That's how you're going to convert between radians and degrees on the SAT math section. Now, one thing that I guess I can quick cover here is just the canceling of units, right? Let's say that we wanted to go from, we'll say, liters to milliliters. Let's say that we had one liter, or we'll go with 10. We'll say we had 10 liters. Let's say that we want to know what the, how many milliliters that is. I just want to quick show you this because I think it's a tip that you should know from day one because I think it's really useful. Let's say that we want to know how many milliliters it is. We know milliliters in one liter. So 1,000 milliliters per one liter. Okay, notice how I have liters canceling here. Since my liters will cancel, I know I have 10 times 1,000. That's going to give me 10,000 milliliters are equal to 10 liters. So canceling units is a strategy you can use to make sure you're getting to the correct answer on the SAT math section. That's why I wanted to quick show it to you right there on day one, because I think it's very useful. All right, so at this point, let me just look through, see if there's anything else I need to cover. Okay, I want to cover some stuff with circumferences and lengths of arcs, as well as areas with circles real quick. So you know your circumference, right? I'll put it as circumference. Obviously, your circumference is going to equal 2 times radius also equal to your diameter times pi. Diameter times pi. Okay, now let's say that we needed the length of an arc in a circle, right? So the length of an arc in a circle, let's say that we had, um, it looks something like this, right? Pretend that that's a neat circle. We're just looking for the length of this arc right here, right? Now let's say that we are given our angle as, we'll say it's 160 degrees. Okay, well then our arc length, right, our arc length can be found by doing our central angle, which in this case we said was 160 degrees, by 360 degrees, because right? that's your normal circle's central angle, and then multiplying it by pi times our radius, uh, pi times our radius times two, or pi times our diameter. Right. So either one, either pi times your radius times two, or pi times your diameter, whichever way you want to think about it. Okay, now note that you can also do this, the same arc length equation using radians. Let's say that we had, uh, we'll do pi over 2 radians, right? So that'd be a 90 degree angle, and we want to know what that arc length is. Then we just do pi over 2 radians all over in a circle that has 2 pi, and then we'd multiply by pi, and then by our diameter. So that would get our arc length if we were using radians as well. Now if we want to find the area of a sector of a circle. So let's say we wanted to find the area of something with, a, we'll say, an angle of, we'll do 120 degrees this time. So we got a 120 degree angle, right? And we want to know what the area is, so area A. Right? Well, our area equation for a sector of a circle is going to be our central angle, which we said was in this case 100. Right, and I'll put that over here, 120 degrees, all over that 360 degrees in total again, right? Because that's what a normal circle would have. And then we just use our normal formula for the area of a circle, pi r squared. Once again, if we we're doing this in radians, let's say that we had one that was 90 degrees. So we'll draw 90 degrees. 90 degrees is pi over radians, 2 radians, divided by 2 pi radians, which are normally in a circle, uh, times pi r squared once again. Okay, so you just know how to do it with radians or with degrees. That can be helpful to save you time so you don't have to convert. All right, so as far as anything else that I want to touch on in the SAT math section, let me take a look through my notes. All right, so I've got one more, uh, one more equation, and then I have one trick that I want to also show you today. All right, so last equation and then a trick. 
So your last equation is going to be dealing with polygons. Polygons aren't dealt with a ton on the SAT math section, but they are there, so you do need to know a few things with them. All right, so let's say that you have a regular polygon, right? So a regular polygon is pretty simple. Let's just draw it right here. Say that it's something like this. All right, let's say that that's your polygon. And you need to find the, inter the interior angle. Well, to find your interior angle, you're going to do your number of sides, which we're going to call n. n is your number of sides. You're going to subtract 2 from it, multiply it by 80, and it's going to divide by your number of sides. All right, so that's how you do it. Now, let's, for example, a polygon is a square. A square is a polygon. So if, if a square is a polygon, it's got four sides. And I'll show you what to do. Believe me, four sides minus two times 100. Right, which is obviously going to be four. That's two. Two times 180 is going to give me 360 degrees. The center angle of a square. Angle. Keep in mind. I'll just quick point out what that is. That'd be this angle here. Right, if we had a square, obviously that 90 degree angle. So that's for the central angle of a polygon, of a regular polygon. So you want to put that in your notes as well, right? And this is your equation for that central angle of a regular polygon. All right, so now I've just got to show you the trick that I wanted to show you. This is going to be under the algebra section with parabolas. Um, if I don't have room there, I'll just move to the right and you can put it in your notes. Let me find it real quick. Okay, so this is where I was talking about parabolas. So I want to talk about something with dividing real quick so let's say that we have and this is called the remainder theorem remainder. like i said my pen's not working too great to theorem okay, i spelled theorem wrong but that's all right i know how to spell it my pen's just not working so i'm not gonna fix it all right so let's say that we have an equation we got we'll do 2x cubed we'll do minus x plus 3. Say that we are 2. Now, this is really particular to the multiple choice section because with the multiple choice section, if you use the remainder theorem, you can find the answer a lot quicker than actually doing this division problem because this division problem would take you a while if you were going to actually do it. But if you look at the remainders or the last term and all of your answer choices A through D and they're all different, you can solve this way quicker. So that's why I'm showing it to you right now. All right, so what you're going to do here is you're going to take this x minus 2 and you're going to notice that since it's minus, you just take the 2. Now, if it were x plus 2, you're dividing by 2, but in this case, just taking two. Okay, so you're going to take two then, and you're going to plug it into your top equation, or your numerator in this case. So you're just going to do two times two cubed minus five times two squared plus four times two plus three. Okay, find what it equals. So we got two times two to the third power. Two to the third power is eight. Eight times two is 16. Now you got 16 minus five times two squared. That's going to be minus 20. Then you got plus four times two. That's going to be plus eight. And then you got plus three. Okay, so we got 16 minus 20, that's negative 4. Negative 4 plus 8 is going to be positive 4. Positive 4 plus 7 is going to equal 7. Thus, my remainder then is not going to just be 7, but it's going to be 7 over x minus 2. Okay, so my end part of my, uh, my answer would have to be plus 7 over x minus 2 in this case. So that's something that you can use if you look at answer choices A through D and you see that there's a different remainder in each one then you just go ahead and find what your remainder is using the remainder theorem, and you don't have to worry about dividing the rest of it. So that's a trick that I think that you should have in your notes, because I think it's really important and can save you a ton of time, especially if you're shooting for a 1400 to 1600. This is something you should know. All right, so that's the remainder theorem that covers everything I wanted to cover in the math section for today. It took longer than I thought, so we're going to have to switch over to the writing section now, and whatever remaining time I have, I'll spend in the writing section for today. For today's writing section, we're going to go through some grammar rules. We probably won't get through all of them today because the math section ran a little bit long. So tomorrow we'll do a little bit more with grammar rules and things with the writing section as well as the reading section and a little bit of math. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and get started with the grammar rules. So first thing I want to talk about is the agreement and number between subjects and verbs. Okay, so if you have a subject and a verb, they have to agree in number. An example here, we have a singular subject. So we have Joseph, that's one person, singular then we need the singular verb jumps up into the air. Now, one thing I want to note on verb number, a way you can test this is by using he and they. So if you look at my screen, I have the verb's number. I have he runs versus they run. So if you want to determine whether something's singular, what you want to do is you want to use the word he and then whatever verb you would normally use with that. 
And if you want to determine if it's plural or not, use the word they. If you use the word they, and whatever you would naturally say after that, for example, they run, then you know run is a plural verb, and you know that runs is a singular verb. So we have Joseph jumps into the air. Obviously, those are both singular, so that's correct. Next, we have the plural versions. So we have Joe and John jump up into the air, right? Jump, jump with no S is plural, and Joe and John are plural, so that is also correct. Another example of a singular sentence here. We have the manager writes a letter. Writes is singular, and manager is also singular, so that is correct as well. Next, we have another example of a plural. We have the managers write a letter, right? We drop the S because it is plural at that point, right? We have managers plural, then we need the plural verb write. So one thing that you can tell here is obviously there's a bit of a pattern with the S at the end. If there is an S at the end of the verb that can be dropped without messing up the base of the word, for example, the base in run is run, then it is likely singular form if it has that S on the end, right? It's likely to be singular if it has that S tacked onto the end of the base word. Okay, the next thing you need to do is you need to watch out for collective nouns. So collective nouns, what are they? Well, they're not very intimidating, even though they may sound like it. Collective nouns are just used to group a collection of individuals or singular subjects into one singular subject. So an example is Congress. Congress is a collective noun referring to all the people within Congress. So an example of using Congress incorrectly as far as subject and verb matching would be if you said Congress are going to dismiss. Congress is singular because it's a collective noun. Now the verb are is plural. Okay, so that's not correct because we're not matching our subject and our verb uh, in number. So that would be incorrect. Now the correct version would be Congress is going to dismiss because Congress is a collective noun and is is a singular verb. So we need to match that singular noun, singular verb. So the correct example would be Congress is going to dismiss. Next thing, prepositional phrases. I want to talk about that as well. You need to understand that when determining um, matching the number of a subject to the number of the verb, you need to ignore prepositional phrases. So prepositional phrases are phrases that modify a subject and include a preposition and an object. So let's take a look at the examples here. So the first sentence we have is the band of clarinet players is very loud. Okay, so some people would see players and think that the verb should be plural, but that's wrong. Okay, a prepositional phrase in this case is of clarinet players. Now when we have a prepositional phrase and we're determining the number of our subject and verb, we want to ignore it. So we would ignore of clarinet players because that's a prepositional phrase. So then we have the band. Band is singular. We need a singular verb, which is is. So that is correct. Next example of a prepositional phrase is the group with the most basketball players is going to win. With the most basketball players is a prepositional phrase. So we would want to get rid of that when determining our number of our subject and our number of our verb. We see we have group, which is singular, and we need to have then a singular uh, verb to pair with it, so we have the verb is. The group is going to win, right? And you can also tell that by taking out the prepositional phrase, you basically still have a full sentence, which is a sign that it is a prepositional phrase and should be ignored when determining the number of the subject and the verb. Next thing I want to talk about is going to be pronouns. So pronouns, some examples, he, she, they, that, and those. All right, those are all pronouns. Um, let's talk about some rules with pronouns then. So it must be clear who or what the pronoun is referring to. You can't just use a pronoun anywhere. It has to be clear who it's referring to. Next thing, the number of the pronoun must also agree with the number of its subject. All right, so let's go through some examples. We have John is a fast runner, semicolon, he goes on a long run every day. All right, well, we know John is singular, and we know that he is also singular. We know that it's clear that he is referring to John because there's no other person involved. John is obviously a uh, it sounds like a, it, uh, he obviously is a male in the sentence, thus he is correct here. So that is a correct example. Let's look at our next example. We have Jason and John. That's two people. That's going to be plural, run every day, and they. So that's a plural pronoun. So that agrees in number. It's also clear who it's referring to. It's obviously Jason and John are going to run on Sunday. So that's another example of correct. Now let's take a look at a sentence that would be incorrect, that we'd have to fix. We have Jason and Joe, which is obviously going to be plural, run every day, and it says he gets tired, right? See, that's not clear who it's referring to. Is it referring to Jason or is it referring to Joe? So it's unclear. Obviously, it's not matching the number of our subject either because our subject's plural in Jason and Joe and he is singular. So that would be incorrect. So we could fix that by taking out he and putting in um, they get tired a lot, right? We'd have to drop the S on gets as well. So it would be they get tired a lot. All right. So what's wrong with this? Obviously, it's unclear who it's being referred to. Um, let's go through another incorrect example, right? So we have uh, the computers, and then we have of students in Poland. Of students in Poland is a prepositional phrase. So we want to get rid of that. So we would have the computers are newer, right? Computers is plural. Um, the verb are, right? We know that the verb are is plural as well because we would say they are. So now we have the computers are newer then, and now we have that. That is singular, right? But we need to match the plural. Okay, so we have of students in New York, obviously a prepositional phrase. So we ignore it. Now we need to have of are newer than those, okay, to match that plural part. 
Okay, so once again, matching plural, we would need to say are newer than those of students in New York. So what's wrong? The number's incorrect, right? We gotta ignore prepositional phrases for pronouns when determining number. Let's take a look at the correct example. We have the computers of students in Poland. Once again, ignoring prepositional phrases are newer than those of students in New York. Okay, so obviously we have plural those, plural are, and plural computers, that is correct. All right, types of sentences. Let's co cover this real quick. We've got simple sentences. Simple sentence, they have one subject and they have one verb. An example is the dog swam to shore. Subject is dog, verb is swam. So a simple sentence is generally pretty short, pretty simple, only one subject, one verb. Let's take a look at compound sentences then. So compound sentences, they got two subjects and they got two verbs, right? So an example of a compound sentence would be the man ran home, comma, and he ate a meal, right? We have subject man, verb, ran. So we got one subject, one verb, complete thought, comma, and then we use a fanboy. Now, if you don't know what the fanboys are, they are for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so. Okay, so if we're going to connect two, um, two independent clauses together to form a compound sentence, we either use a comma and one of the fanboys, or we have to use a semicolon. Okay, so if we're going to use a semicolon, we would get rid of and, and we would just replace the comma with a semicolon. Okay, so we have the man ran home and he ate a meal, right? Subject he, verb a. So we see we have two subjects, two verbs connected by a comma and a fanboy. So that's obviously correct. Next, we have a compound complex sentence. Compound complex sentences contain two independent clauses, just like the compound sentences do, but they also have at least one dependent clause. So how do you know if it's a dependent clause? Well, you can use context clues in the form of subordinating conjunctions. Now, if you don't know what those are, look for the following words. All after, although, as, because, before, even if, even though, if, in order to, once, provided that, rather than, since, so that, than, that, though, unless, until, when, whenever, where, whereas, wherever, whether, well, and why. Those are all subordinating conjunctions that indicate what follows is likely going to be a dependent clause. So let's take a look at an example sentence. We have the woman ate her breakfast. That's an independent clause. We have subject woman, verb ate, her breakfast, comma, and, so we're using that comma and a fanboy to connect two independent clauses. The man ate his lunch, another independent clause, subject man, verb ate, when he was on break. When we see that that's a uh, subordinating conjunction indicating to us what follows is likely going to be a dependent clause. We have when he was on break, obviously going to be a dependent clause there because that could not be a sentence on its own. Because if we were to say when he was on break, we would say what did he do, right? It's not a complete thought, so it has to be a dependent clause. So that right there is a compound complex sentence. You can also have a compound complex sentence that uses a semicolon instead of a common a fanboy. But keep in mind, in order for it to be compound complex, it obviously would have to have um, a subordinate, a uh, dependent clause at some point. Now, you don't need to be able to identify independent clauses and dependent clauses in the sense that they will ask you which one's the independent clause, but you have to know this in order to understand uh, why certain things are grammatically correct and where to have commas, where to have semicolons, and things like that. So that's why I taught this right there. Okay, next thing I want to talk about is comma splices, okay? So these should be easy points because they should be pretty easy to pick out. So a comma splice is when you have two independent clauses that are separated by only a comma and no coordinating conjunction, or in other words, they don't have any of the fanboys in them. So no for, and, nor, but, or, yet, or so. There's none of that following the and. So an example would be, um, and this is an example of a comma, comma splice, so keep in mind this is an error that would have to be fixed. Comma splices are errors grammatically and they have to be fixed. So we have the man is very fast, comma, the woman is the fastest hurler in America. If we're going to fix this, we would have to put a comma after fast, which we already have, but then we would have to put the word and after that comma, okay? So then we'd have and the woman is the fastest hurdler in America. So that would fix that. Next, we have the dog is very small, the cat is the same size as the dog. Once again, we could fix that by adding and after that comma after small. So obviously we see we have two independent clauses connected by only a comma there, so that's a comma splice. We'd want to put and in after that comma to make it a full a uh, compound sentence that is grammatically correct. Next, I want to talk about some run-on sentences. So we got examples of run-on sentences. The man ate his food and he went to the doctor, right? There's no comma there. I'll go ahead and get rid of that so you can see. Okay, the man ate his food and went to the do and he went to the doctor. That's a run-on sentence. In order to fix that, we'd have to have a comma after food. Next up, we got the woman ran to the store. She enjoyed her shopping trip. That's two independent clauses. We have a subject woman, we have a verb ran, and we have a subject she and a verb enjoyed. Okay, so if we wanted to fix that, we could put in a semicolon to have the woman ran to the store, semicolon, she enjoyed her shopping trip. That would make that a compound sentence. That's grammatically correct. 
Next thing we can talk about is sentence fragments. Sentence fragments cannot stand alone as sentences on their own. An example would be the crispiness from the apple. You can check if a sentence is a sentence fragment by um, asking yourself if it could stand alone as a sentence and still have meaning. If it could not stand alone on a sentence and still have meaning, then it's a sentence fragment and cannot be its own sentence. So if you were to say the crispiness from the apple or his shoes from the store, you would then be thinking, well, what about them? Because it's not a complete thought and it doesn't have meaning. So those are sentence fragments that would have to be fixed because they can't be sentences on their own. Next thing I want to talk about is modifiers. Modifiers are really important on the SAT writing section. So modifiers, they modify subjects and other words in order to give them more description. Modifiers have to be placed directly next to what they modify. This is really important. You need to make sure you know that. Modifiers have to be placed directly next to what they're modifying. So we, that means we need to have a comma after our modifier if it's introductory, right? So if my um, modifying clause is at the beginning of my sentence, I need to have a comma right after it. Or if my modifying clause or my modifier is in the middle of my sentence and it's non-essential and it's in the middle of a sentence, and I'll talk more about being non-essential later, it has to be offset with commas on both sides. So let's take a look at some examples. So an example of an introductory modifier would be the world's brightest mathematician, and then we have to have a comma, Jim Simons. So notice that Jim Simons is the world's brightest mathematician, thus it is modifying him. That is modifier modifying Jim Simons. So that is correct. Next, we have Jim Simons, comma, the world's brightest mathematician. So we see we have our modifier right after our subject, so that's perfectly fine. We have a comma before it, and we have a comma after it is a genius. Now, what do I mean by non-essential? Let me go ahead and break that down. It's non-essential, right, which means we offset it with commas. Now, how do we know something is non-essential? We know something is non-essential if we can take it out and the sentence still has meaning and makes sense. In this case, we'd have Jim Simons as a genius. That's an independent clause. Full sentence makes sense on its own. Therefore, we know the world's brightest mathematician is non-essential and must be offset with commas. Or you could also use parentheses or um, two dashes as well. Let's take a look at an incorrect example. Jim Simons is a genius, comma, the world's brightest mathematician. We see we have our subject that our modifier should be modifying of Jim Simons is separated from our modifier. Okay, we can't have those things be separated. They have to be right next to each other so you know that that would be incorrect. Okay, so notice that that would be incorrect. So that takes us through the writing section and today's lessons for day one. Tomorrow I'll do some more with the SAT writing section as well as the reading section and some more with the math section. So as always, hopefully this was helpful. If it was, make sure to like, share, and subscribe. There'll be a donation link in the description if you're interested in donating. Um, as always, make sure to have a great day.